You're listening to the I'm Busy Being Awesome podcast with Paula Angabretson, episode number 279. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the podcast. How are you? So I want to ask you a question. And admittedly, it is a little bit rhetorical, which is great because this is a podcast and I can't actually hear you, which is kind of a bummer. I wish that I could. Uh, but anyway, I'm curious. How often do you think about the obstacles that come along the side of change? How often do you think to yourself, why is it so hard to make this change stick? This shouldn't be so hard. Why is this such a challenge? You know, you have the best of intentions. You've made a plan. And for whatever reason, those changes just don't seem to last. They don't seem to stick around. If you are nodding along, please, first and foremost, know that I see you. (laughs) You are not alone. As someone with ADHD, I know it well. We have all been there, okay? What I want to stress right off the top is that change is not meant to happen overnight. That's not the way it works. Change is a process where things happen in stages, right? Change happens in stages, and it's the same for all of us. All of us navigate these stages, and that's what I want to talk about today. There is a really powerful framework called the Trans-Theoretical Model of Change. (laughs) It was developed in the 1970s, and I want to talk about that today, okay? In this model... These two psychologists explain that when we're going through change, whether it's starting a new habit or breaking an old habit or creating a whole new routine or whatever, we're actually moving through five distinct stages. Five. Okay. And I think that understanding these changes and that there actually are five, not just that you're doing it or you're not, this can make a huge difference. Okay. So let me just give you a quick rundown of what the five stages are, and then we're going to look at them more in depth and how to recognize which stage you might be in depending on the different changes you're making right now, okay? So the first stage is called pre-contemplation. So this is a point at which you're not actually thinking about change. You're just kind of going about your life. You're engaging with the world. You're doing your thing. And the idea of making a change isn't really on your radar. You know, maybe you haven't noticed that something needs to shift or it just doesn't seem that important yet. It hasn't tripped you up enough times to flag in your mind. Okay. So that's pre-contemplation. Then we move into the contemplation stages, the stage two. This is when you do start noticing, huh, things don't seem to be working right now. (laughs) They don't seem to be working as well as they could be. And you might start reflecting on some patterns or some habits or some situations that you might want to shift. And this is when we really start kind of thinking about what's not working and why we might want to change, how our life might be easier if we could make those changes, but we're not doing anything yet, okay? We're just contemplating it. Then we get to the preparation stage. This is when we've decided, okay, I'm, I'm ready. I'm going to make a change. I've got to do something about this. And so we start making plans. Maybe we start researching different tools or resources. Maybe we ask for advice or we start listening to podcasts or we start gathering the different resources we think we might need. We might also start sharing our intentions with others. We might start talking about, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do this. And I start laying out those small steps to get ready. And then comes action. This is stage four. This is the big one. This is the stage where we are actively making the changes that we had planned. Okay? This is where we're putting in the work. We're shifting our new behaviors. We're creating new routines. It's full of a lot of often physical and mental effort. And it's where we start actually seeing those transformations. Okay. And then finally, we get to maintenance. Now, this is a stage that I think all of us just entirely forget or wish we didn't have to even think about. Okay. I think it's the stage that gets most often overlooked. 
but it is so important because it's all about sustaining those changes that we've made over time, right? So that we can maintain what we've done. Now, many of our brains are like, I've done it. It's over. Why do I have to keep going? We have to because if we want to maintain it, that's where the maintenance comes in. It's kind of annoying, but it's there and it's true. Okay. And if we're not careful, it's super easy to slip back into our old habits or slip back into our old routines, all of which is totally normal, by the way. Okay. Not a problem. Totally normal. Very human. And what we actually need is support and reminders to keep going. But that maintenance phase is there, first and foremost. And it's kind of a challenge until we've really, really locked it in. Now, why is all of this so powerful for us to know? Why is it so impactful for the ADHD brain to know about these five stages of change? Well, first of all, the model helps us to really understand that change is not just the flip of a switch, which is what most of our black and white brains want to think. It is not a one-step process. Again, our ADHD brains do tend to think more in the black and white. We're either doing it or we're not. We started it or we didn't. We're trying or we're failing. Okay. Now, I love this framework because it reminds us that it's all about moving through each stage over time in our own time. And for those of us who might find ourselves easily overwhelmed, I think that knowing there is a structure where each stage builds upon the next can make the whole change process feel a lot more manageable. And what I find especially fascinating, actually, are the first three stages, pre-contemplation, contemplation, and preparation. These are what I think about as the foundation stages, and they are so crucial because they lay that groundwork for everything that follows. Without those three steps, we wouldn't be ready to take action, let alone maintain the changes that we created. And again, I mentioned that I find these three so fascinating because I think that it's so easy for us to dismiss these three stages because we don't see the immediate results, the immediate changes. I know for myself, my brain loves to think, well, if I'm just thinking about change, that doesn't count. Thinking isn't changing, right? Or I'm still preparing, so I'm clearly not doing enough because I don't see anything happening. Does your brain ever think similar things? <laughs> if so, hello, clearly you're in good company. We often think that we're not moving forward because we're not seeing those instant wins, right? But here's what's true. These stages, these first three stages are essential in the change process. Just because you can't see the change yet doesn't mean it's not happening. All right. And this is where, as I mentioned, we can start to break free from that all or nothing mindset, which many of us ADHD brains navigate. We tend to think if I'm not taking action right now, I'm failing or I'm not doing it or it doesn't count. But when we can understand that there are actually three foundational stages before we're even taking action, and they're all a key part of this journey, we can give ourselves the permission to honor where we are in that process. It's not just about jumping straight into perfect action, right? It's about giving ourselves the time and space to move forward through those five stages at your own pace. That's what success looks like moving through the five stages at your pace. And probably the most beautiful component of all with this five stage process of change is the opportunity for self-compassion that comes with it. Because instead of beating ourselves up for quote unquote not doing enough, which comes so naturally for many of us, <laughs> we're all pretty darn good at beating ourselves up. Instead, we can start recognizing that thinking about change is actually progress, is actually a key component. Reflecting on what's not working 
That is progress. Preparing, researching, gathering resources. This is all an important component of the change process. Every step, no matter how small, counts because each one is required to move to the next stage. And when we can help our brains see it in this way and remind ourselves, no, this is literally developed by psychologists. This is science-backed, right? It can help reduce that constant self-criticism, right? And we can celebrate every little win along the way and trust that we are moving forward, even if we're not in that taking action stage yet. Now, I do have some caveats about that, which we'll talk about in just a minute, but I, I want us to land in that first. Okay, I really want to reinforce that change is not a one step process. And wherever you are within these five stages, you are making progress. And that deserves to be celebrated. All right, so let's talk about what this change process looks like more specifically. Okay, let's talk about these five stages. Let's dive in and understand the role they play, what they look like, because the more we understand them, the more we can identify where we are in our journeys and identify the supports we might need to help us move into the next stage with less friction, with less overwhelm, with less getting stuck. Yes, please. Okay, so let's dive into the first stage first because that makes sense. And the first stage is pre-contemplation. Okay, this is the stage where you're not really ready and you might not even know that there's a thing that needs to change. Okay. So this kind of sounds like a weird stage. My brain kind of wrestles with it. I'm like, is that really a stage if I don't even know? And then I was reflecting on it and I was able to find some examples in my own life. And I want to share them with you just in case your brain is kind of wrestling with this first stage too. Okay. So to put this into context, I'm going to share an example from my life when I was still in the world of academia. Okay, so when I was a professor, grading student papers was the bane of my existence. <laughs> that and Route 9 in Boston. <laughs> Those two things, veins of my existence. Grading student papers took me forever. And it actually wasn't on the surface because I was trying to make everything perfect. It was a little bit deeper than that in that I was so worried about upsetting my students with the feedback. I think I was feeling some secondhand rejection sensitivity or, you know, that I've had bad feedback and it really kind of tore me to shreds in grad school and I didn't want to do that to my students. I just dreaded the idea of impacting them in some sort of negative way. Apparently, I thought I had a lot more power and could control how they felt. And I also dreaded the idea of them confronting me and asking me why I would grade it in a certain way. Or again, I didn't want them to feel bad about their writing or the work they did. So I would spend hours tweaking my comments. I would look for tons of examples to kind of justify why I gave them one grade over another. And I would try and anticipate basically every possible reaction they might have. I created, as I'm sure you can tell, so much unnecessary work for myself, especially because it, I don't get this. This was not me as a student, but most students don't even read any of the comments. <laughs> what am I doing? So all of this was done essentially in an effort to try and control how my students would respond to their grades, to their feedback, which spoiler alert is not possible because we can't control the other humans or their emotions. Again, it's so annoying, but we can't. Now, at the time, I didn't realize this was a problem, okay? Again, I'm still in pre-contemplation stage. I just thought, well, this is how grading works for me. It just takes this long. It takes forever, period, fact. And it wasn't until a colleague joked with me saying, you can't spend more time grading the student papers than they spent writing them. And they were saying it in jest. And there were times where probably I did spend longer giving feedback. And it was such a huge wake-up call for myself. I was completely stuck in this behavior without realizing how much it was weighing me down. And here's the thing. Being in 
this pre-contemplation stage, it's not a problem. So if you're looking back and you're going, why didn't I see this before? We're not doing that. Because when we're in the pre-contemplation stage, we're collecting data. We're collecting experiences. We don't know that something's not working well because it just hasn't come to light yet. Or we haven't gotten to the point where the discomfort is noticeable enough to create a change. Or we haven't heard a comment from a colleague that kind of wakes you up like it happened to me. So if you're in this stage or if you're looking back on this stage, probably more likely, give yourself some grace here because, it, again, it's all part of the process. So for myself, in that example, it took that outside perspective. It took my colleague to highlight and help me see what was going on that wasn't working. And sometimes that's what we need because we don't actually recognize that we're stuck because we've normalized that struggle. It just feels like, well, this is how things are, which frankly, I think kind of sums up the experience of an adult with ADHD, especially those of us with a later diagnosis, or if we're still going through the diagnosis process, because we're just sitting here thinking, well, isn't this just the way it is? Doesn't it just have to be this hard? I mean, it's probably just me. I probably just need to work harder, try harder, work faster, do more, make up for all the problems that are me in this world. <laughs> this is what we do. And I hope that this podcast actually is that little nudge for some of you and that it helps you go, oh, wait, hold on. Maybe, maybe I don't have to struggle. Maybe I could put in some supports. Maybe it doesn't have to be this hard. Maybe it isn't me. Maybe it's just that the world is not built for an ADHD brain, okay? And then usually what naturally happens at some point is we start noticing the discomfort, whether it's through someone else making a comment or because the frustration becomes too much or you see a TikTok or a reel or a podcast and you realize, hold on, this is not working and it doesn't have to be this way. And that is what moves us from pre-contemplation into contemplation. It's that moment of recognition where you start thinking, hold on, maybe there's a different way. Okay, so then we get to stage two, which is contemplation. We're starting to think about making a change. That moment of pondering is what introduces us to stage two, the contemplation stage. This stage is all about thinking about change. We haven't acted on it yet, but it is on our radar. It might be in the back of our mind, might fall out of our minds for some time. But then it comes back in. We're just kind of thinking about it. We start noticing some patterns. We might start asking ourselves some questions like, well, is that even working for me? Why is this so hard? How might I change? Could I change this? Is it, is it possible? How do they do it? Right? It's this place where, again, we know something needs to change. We know we want to have a shift somewhere, but we're not quite sure how we're going to make it happen. And for a lot of us with ADHD, this is where we tend to get stuck thinking and thinking and thinking, but not actually moving forward. Okay. So let's break down what the contemplation might look like with a couple of different examples. So maybe you're struggling to start your morning routine. You know that your mornings are chaotic and they leave you feeling really rushed and stressed out. And you've been thinking about a routine for a while. You know, you want some sort of routine to help you feel grounded and help you feel a little more collected in the morning. But the idea of actually setting one up just seems super overwhelming. And you keep thinking different things like, well, I'll, I'll figure it out next week or now's not a good time. Maybe, maybe next month or I'll start on Monday or whatever it is. But we haven't actually taken any steps yet to start shifting or dropping into our new routine. Okay, so if this sounds familiar, that might be the contemplation stage. Or maybe you're thinking about setting some boundaries at work. You notice, okay, so you've started to notice, hold on, I say yes to way too much stuff at work. I am overcommitted. I have no time to actually do my own work because I'm helping everybody else. And you're feeling really stretched thin. And you're considering some boundaries. You hear people talk about this word boundaries. 
You might even think about saying no to some new projects, but you're worried about how people will react, right? The idea of having these conversations might feel a bit stressful. So you kind of just keep contemplating it. You haven't taken any steps yet. So this is contemplation stage. As I mentioned, this is where a lot of brains tend to get stuck because we know something's off. We recognize the need for change, but the how behind it, right? The how we do it might seem way too overwhelming or too hard or too unfamiliar, or maybe we're not uncomfortable enough to actually try something different yet. Now, here's what I want to stress about the contemplation stage. Once again, this stage is a key component in the change process. I know it might not seem like it. Your brain might be like, all I'm doing is thinking. All I ever do is think about this. But if we don't do that, we would never move to the next stage. Okay? Reflecting on what's working and what's not working is an essential part of the journey, even if you haven't acted yet. Because you're starting to bring awareness to what needs to shift which is a huge step. So give yourself credit here. Even if you're not moving forward, you are contemplating. Your brain is helping you here in figuring out what changes you want to make. Then we get to stage three, which is preparation. This is where we get ready to act. So after we spend some time in contemplation, where you're thinking about the change but haven't done it yet, something starts to shift. This is when we start to actually feel ready. We're like, okay, you know what? Now, I want to do this. I actually do want to set some boundaries at work, or I do want to finally get to bed on time or whatever. You're no longer just in the what ifs and the thinking abouts, but instead we're going to, okay, I'm going to do this. What do I need to do? What do I need to do in order to make this happen? And this is what moves us into preparation. It's the stage where you're not quite yet in action mode, but you're gearing up for it. For those of you who live in cold climates like me in Minnesota, it's the part where you're warming up your car before you're actually driving it. Right? You have to kind of warm things up a bit. You're gathering your resources. You're doing your research. You're figuring out what needs to be in place before you can take that first step. So I'll give you an example of this from my own business. When I brought on a VA for my team for the first time, I quickly realized that my usual system of staying organized, which was my paper planner, right, my paper system, was not effective for keeping track of tasks and projects and everything. It just wasn't cutting it anymore because suddenly I had to manage all of these moving pieces with somebody who is virtual in a different part of the country and trying to track progresses and keep everything organized. It just, it wasn't it. Okay. And honestly, it just felt like everything was discombobulated. I can't even say the word. Everything was discombobulated. I couldn't remember what I'd asked her to do, what was in motion, what still needed to be handled or delegated. My brain was like, what is happening? I knew I needed to change. Right. And then I went into preparation because rather than just diving into action, I had to figure out what I was going to do which is that preparation stage. So I started researching different tools and exploring project management systems, asking other people in the online business space what they liked, what they were using, what they didn't like. That is when I rediscovered my love of Todoist, which quickly became a game changer for my team. And so then I spent time learning how to use Todoist with others because I'd only ever really use it just for myself. And so I was testing out features and watching some YouTube videos on how others have used it with a team and figuring out how I can integrate it into my current workflow. And this is what the preparation stage is all about, gathering the resources, making those decisions, asking questions, and getting ready to implement. So you're laying that groundwork, you're making a commitment to the change, but you're doing so in a way that feels manageable, all right? So it's about setting yourself up for success before you dive in. Now, <laughs> this has a big asterisk next to it. We want to be careful about not getting stuck in the preparation stage. Now, again, this is true for all of our stages, 
except for maybe maintenance. You kind of want to stay <laughs> maintaining. Uh, but in these earlier stages, this is true for all of them. We don't want to get stuck in them. But I especially want to highlight, underline, bold, and asterisk this particular stage because this is where so many of my clients and many of you listeners, because I've heard from you, this is where we get stuck because this, my friends, is where the front end perfectionists love to hang out, right? This is where we think, well, I just want to prepare a little more. I just want to do a little more research. Let me just gather a few more resources. Once I learn a little bit more or set up this or get my desk just this way, that's when I'll be ready to make the change. And again, while this stage is key, there's also the sneaky allure of staying here for quite a bit longer than we need to. Okay, so if you notice that you might be in this stage right now, this preparation stage, this is where we might want to check in and do a little bit of reflection. How long have I been in here? What do I actually need to prepare to take those first steps, right? Reminding ourselves that those small steps are key. So maybe if we use my uh, example with trying to find some sort of online project management with my VA, it was researching the tools or creating a list of options to explore one step at a time and deciding I'm going to look at three or four or four or five different options. Once I've gone through them, that's enough, right? Now, as a side note, if you are curious about using Todoist, whenever I mention Todoist on the podcast, people tend to reach out about it. If you're interested in using Todoist for either your personal digital task management and project management or with a team, I do have an affiliate code that you can use. It'll give you two free months of their pro plan. And it's one of those great kind of codes where you don't actually have to put in your credit card where you get the two months free and then inevitably forget to cancel, <laughs> which is what would happen to me. This is one where it just gives you two months free. You don't have to put in a credit card. And then if you don't go with the pro plan, it'll drop you down to the basic plan. So if you want to give Todoist a try, I'll link to it in the show notes and it'll give you those two months free and see how it works for you. You know, if you've been looking for a great resource for project management or task management in a digital format, I highly encourage you to check it out. I love it. I've been using Todoist for years. And again, the the code, the link is in the show notes for you. Otherwise, you can also head to imbusybeingawesome.com slash Todoist. And that's all one word, T-O-D-O-I-S-T. I'mbusybeingawesome.com slash Todoist. Okay. So that is the preparation stage, which brings us into the fourth stage, which is action, doing the thing, right? We've gathered the resources. We've asked the questions. We've laid the groundwork. We've now reached the stage where most of us recognize that we're quote unquote working toward change. And once again, I'm going to highlight that there has been so much change done already. All of those stages that we've already talked about, they needed to happen before we got to this stage, which is taking action. They were all required. And now we reach the action stage where the, what's that phrase? Where the, the rubber meets the road, okay? Where preparation turns into actual steps forward. It's also the stage that takes the most mental and emotional energy because now you're actually doing the thing. Now, I'm not going to go into a lot of examples and stories here because I'm quite certain most of you know what this one looks like. Again, this is the stage that most of us do associate with taking action. So I'll give you some brief examples, uh, kind of building on what we talked about in the contemplation stage. So let's say you are uh, doing a new routine or something. So you've been contemplating, you've been preparing for a new morning routine, you maybe mapped out some different wake up times for supporting your schedule. You decided on the different workouts you might want to do in the morning. You looked at some simple breakfast options that you could make for yourself in a couple of minutes. Now that you've made those decisions, it's time to give them a try. Now it's time to take action. And so you're taking those first steps. You're trying out your iteration 1.0. Okay. You're getting up. You're going for the morning walk. You're making time for breakfast. You're in action mode. And you're doing your best to stick with it more times than not. But also you're human and you're establishing a new habit. So you're also practicing grace when you don't follow through. Because again, that's human when we're establishing new habits. Or with our boundaries example. So you've 
you've thought about it, you've prepared some talking points and clarified in your mind your boundary. You're like, okay, these are the things that I will do. These are my boundaries. Here's what I'll do if they're crossed. And now it's time to actually have those conversations with your colleagues or your boss or your sister or whatever, setting those boundaries. You've been in the discomfort of saying no to the extra projects and you're actually enforcing those boundaries. This is the action phase, right? Now, this is also the stage where other people might start noticing the change. They might not too because everybody's quite absorbed in their own worlds, uh, which is not a problem, but it's just good to know if you start feeling discouraged, thinking that nobody's noticing. But it might be one of the, the stages where people are noticing. And I'm going to stress one more time for the people in the back. It is so important to recognize that getting to this point took a tremendous amount of effort. For us ADHD brains, taking action, especially on something that's been weighing on us, requires so much energy and cognitive focus. So I think it's so essential for us to celebrate every step of the way that led up to this moment of taking action. For all my clients, this is why I am always talking about celebrating our wins. This is why I love to start our calls this way. This is why I have my Count Your Wins journal, which I will also link to in the show notes. We need to recognize our progress in order to create that action, in order to create the change and then maintain the momentum. And we need that regardless of the stage we're in. And then finally, we get to stage five, which is our maintenance phase. This is where we sustain the change. Now, the maintenance stage, this is also the one that tends to get the most overlooked, but is so, so important. This is the stage all about keeping that hard work we've done, keeping those changes, sustaining those changes over time. And the thing is, it's really tempting to think, well, I've done it. The hard part's over. I'm, I took the action. I made the change. But let me tell you, maintaining the changes that we've worked so hard to implement takes that continuous effort. And I'm not saying this to discourage or to dissuade anybody from working toward changes. Please, this, I love it. I am all in for growth. But what I am saying is that it does take effort to maintain. And I want to highlight this so that when things do feel hard, we don't let that discourage us. We can go, oh yeah, this is the part where things feel hard because I'm in that maintenance stage and I'm figuring out where I can remove friction so that I can maintain more easily. So let's break this down. When we're in maintenance, again, it's easy to think that we've crossed the finish line, but the reality is that the finish line in most situations kind of keeps moving. Just because we've taken the action a couple of times doesn't mean that the change automatically sticks. So this stage requires that constant attention. Now it doesn't have to be perfect, but it requires some checking in, just like maintenance on a car. We don't have to bring it to the mechanic every day. <laughs> that would be ridiculous. But we bring it in for maintenance when we need oil changes or whatever, right? Because if you're anything like me, that pull to slip back into old habits is there for quite a while, okay? And let's be real, life happens, distractions pop up, our schedules change, we're in transition, and suddenly we find ourselves drifting back into what seems more familiar for the brain because it is because we've probably been doing something for 35 plus years and now we're asking our brain hey we're going to do it this way and then we do it for like three weeks and then something changes and we get mad at ourselves for going back to what we've been doing for 35 years give yourself a minute right it's going to take a minute to catch up that's okay you're right on track that's where maintenance comes in now, for those of us with ADHD, this stage can feel especially tough because we might get bored with the routine or lose interest or forget the system that we put in place, right? And if we're not careful, all that progress that we made can start to unravel. And if we don't coach our brain, we might go into catastrophizing. Oh my gosh, it, I ruined it again. I didn't fall through again. That's why maintenance is so powerful. And it's not just about keeping the change going. It's about staying intentional and reminding ourselves why we made this change in the first place and why we want to maintain it, why we want to continue it. 
So how do we stay in the maintenance space without slipping all the way back? The key here is support. It's self-coaching. It's reminders. Maintenance is where we can build those systems, that extra scaffolding, the accountability, the self-reflection, the self-coaching, bringing that into our daily lives. It's about staying connected to what's working and constantly checking in with ourselves and supporting ourselves in that way. It's about putting in those practical supports to make maintenance easier. As I mentioned, it does take work, but it doesn't have to be so much work. We can smooth that out so that we can sustain it for the long haul. Whether that's creating accountability, working with a coach, checking in with a friend, using an app, doing a body double, whatever, using visual cues, right? Using self-reflection, self-coaching. All of these different options can be incredibly powerful in helping sustain these incredible changes that you've made. All right, so we've just walked through these five stages according to the trans theoretical model of change. We have pre-contemplation where we're not quite yet aware of the specific change that needs to happen. Then we're in contemplation when we start thinking about change, but we're not quite ready to act on it yet. Then we have preparation where we gather the resources and make plans to move forward. Then we have action, which is when we're ready to start implementing those changes. And then we get to maintenance, when we work to sustain the changes we've made over time. Again, each stage plays a crucial role. And I want to stress that despite the way I presented it today, the process does not have to be linear either. You might find yourself kind of fluidly moving back and forth between these stages. That's okay. All right? Change is a journey. It is not a straight line. You've probably seen those memes and things on Instagram where, you know, we think change looks like this and it's a clean uphill curve, right? And what it really looks like is a big messy ball of lines and scribbles and eventually we get to the other side. So if you're moving back and forth between these stages, not a problem. Welcome to being human. <laughs> so this week, I encourage you to get curious about where you are within these five stages of change. Take a look at the different areas of your life, whether it's your work or your personal routines or your relationships, your health, whatever. I encourage you to start identifying where you are within these five stages throughout the week. Get curious and observe where you are. No judgment, just awareness. Okay? And please also remember that wherever you are, whatever answers you find is awesome. Because in order to get where you're going, you have to know where you are first. So with whatever answers you find when you're reflecting on your change, they are all helpful. Think about it like this. A GPS doesn't work if it doesn't know your current location. I can't just tell Google Maps, get me to the airport. It won't get me there if it doesn't know where I'm at right now. And the same is true for if we're figuring out our stages of change. If we don't know where we are now, we can't figure out the next step. We can't figure out our roadmap to get to the next stage and to ultimately get to that maintenance space. When you identify your current stage, you help yourself navigate those changes so much more effectively. And what's more, you can stop beating yourself up for not being in a different stage and start honoring where you are. And then from there, you can plan your next move with greater clarity, with greater confidence, knowing you're on the right path. Now, if you have been listening and you're thinking to yourself, okay, but I just, I still feel stuck. I hear you. Whether you're struggling to move from contemplation into preparation or the preparation into action, or you're finding it hard to maintain those changes that you've worked so hard to make, please know you're not failing. This is a perfectly human thing to do. And there might be some space here for some troubleshooting or some adjustments or some additional scaffolding you want to put in place. And if you're feeling stuck, let's talk. I would love to help you create your own personalized systems that actually work for your ADHD brain. 
will set them up together to help ensure that you are creating that change and maintaining the momentum, all of which are absolutely critical to make lasting change. So you can learn more about how we can work together both one-on-one -on -one and in my small group coaching program through the links in the show notes, or you can head to imbusybeingawesome.com slash coaching to learn more about both. All right, my friends, that's going to do it for us this week. And don't forget, if you want to streamline your holidays and focus on what matters most for you and your loved ones this season, be sure to grab my holiday season blueprint. It is packed with over 70 pages of resources and guides so that you can shape the season to work best for you. You can grab it now through the link in the show notes or head to imbusybeingawesome.com slash holiday blueprint, all one word, imbusybeingawesome.com slash holiday blueprint. Also, do you know someone who would love to learn more about these five stages of change? If so, would you be a rock star and share this episode with them? You could send it to them in a text message or snap a screenshot of the episode and throw it on your Instagram stories, whatever you do. Please know that I so appreciate you for both tuning in and for helping me get these strategies to even more busy, awesome brains who need them. Until next time, keep being awesome. I'll talk with you soon.